the best piece of advice I've gotten on this topic, and I give it all the time, is what I call small pond, big pond thinking. And it's a, it's a fairly sim simple framework that when you're making a job decision, you're either going to be either going to be the big fish in a small pond or the small fish in a big pond. When you're the small fish in a big pond, so if you were to go join Google today or join Facebook today or Microsoft today or so on, the pond kind of is what it is. So you have to worry about the size of the fish. Hey, Shishir, thanks for being on Arda Spotlight, Live Long and Prosper. <laughs> thanks for having me. I love, I love the theme. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really about uh, helping our members and our users learn from, you know, literati and glitterati like you. So we're hoping we'll be able to shed some of the spotlights into how you thought about life, how you made uh, pretty big decisions. So I'd love for you to like maybe identify a couple of pivotal decisions. I mean, I can obviously think of a couple that I've known you over the last uh, you know, 15, 20 years. But um, like, let's take one of these decisions and I'd love for you to think, tell us a little bit about what drove that decision as you made a big career choice uh, and sort of how career, family, money, I mean, any other factors played into you making that decision. I haven't changed jobs that many times, so I, I think each of them was fairly pivotal. And I can probably talk about um, uh, maybe I'll just talk about them in in, in order quickly. The um, so the first one was coming out of school. I uh, was at MIT and deciding about which jobs to take and and so on. And I had a buddy who said, "Hey, like none of these jobs look that interesting. Uh, why don't we?" Do a research project together, and we somehow convinced them to let us go to grad school, to grad school together, and and do a joint thesis. Um, and then I didn't really realize at the at the time, but he had a little entrepreneurial spirit in him, and so he wanted to take this idea and apply to this business plan competition. And so there was definitely a pivotal moment where we decided I decided not to accept any job offers, and I decided to take this research project and apply what was then called the 50k entrepreneurship competition at MIT. It's now the 100k competition that's, you know, I guess 20 years of inflation. Um, and the, uh, and we ended up doing quite well, turned out, you know, I hadn't really thought about entrepreneurship that way, but all of a sudden I got hooked. Um, that was definitely my sort of first pivotal. I don't think I really thought that hard about it. It just seemed like kind of the fun thing to do. And, um, that was how we started my first company, Centrata. Uh, probably next most obvious pivot was leaving Centrata. So about, Two and a half years in, uh, Centrata had done okay. I think we were we were a utility computing company, probably similar, if you were looking at today, kind of similar to what um, AWS and Azure and, uh, and uh, Google Cloud have become. But we were probably 10 years ahead of our time, maybe eight years ahead of our time. There was no such thing as virtual machines. There was no such thing as containers. Like all the basic ideas that allow, yeah, the building blocks that allow you to run compute at uh, scale as a utility, just didn't exist yet. And so we had basically become a big enterprise software company. And, um, you know, there was this really interesting uh, conversation I had with a advisor of mine, this guy named Peter Relland. Uh, at the time, he was a CTO of Webvan. The company doesn't exist anymore, but it was the, for uh, the the modern or the old version of what today is Instacart um, is, uh, is Webvan. And so I was talking to Peter and I said, um, hey, you know, we're building this this enterprise application, uh, and I have to admit something. I use this term all the time. I have no idea what enterprise application means. Like it's a yeah, I went to a pretty good college. Like I took all the courses. Like this is not a term that actually means anything to anybody. And uh, he kind of laughed, and he gave and he and I said, so can you define it for me? He said, I'll give you two definitions. And so one definition he gave me was um, he said an enterprise application is where you take a group of people. You find some process that they're doing over and over and over again, and you find the best way to do that process, and then you write software that forces them all to do the same process the exact same way over and over again, and you turn humans into robots, and that's how you create scale. And that's one definition. It's like they're the least inspiring definition of enterprise applications you can find. And the second one was you take a group of people, you find out whatever spreadsheet they're using to run themselves, and you turn that spreadsheet into software. And that one really stuck with me. And every customer we onboarded into Centrata, basically what we were replacing was doc spreadsheets and slides. And so the reason I tell all of that is this is back in 2001, 2002. So when I decided to move on from Centrata, Centrata basically became a consulting company, stopped being as interesting for me. 
decided to move on. Um, one of my, my primary investors at the time was Vinod Kosla. Now, at the time, he was at Kleiner Perkins. Now, he's at Kosla Ventures. And Vinod tried to convince me not to leave. And then he said, hey, if you're going to leave, at least go to something in the Kleiner Perkins portfolio. And they said, okay, which company do you have in mind? And he said, well, there's a, you know, one that's really hot right now is these two Stanford guys that started the new search engine. It's called Google. You might, you might really like it. Why don't you go talk to them? And so I go over to talk to Larry and Sergey, and they actually hadn't hired any PMs yet. So this is Scoby, Scoby first PM at, at Google. And I ended up turning them down. And the reason was because I had an old boss of mine. I'd been an intern at Microsoft and I had an old boss of mine who called me up and said, Hey, we're starting a new project. We're going to turn office into a front end for business applications. And I just thought the idea was like so obvious to me. Like I just gotten out of this conversation with with uh, Peter Rellen about how people have have mixed up what mean what an application is and what what a document is. And I just thought it was really exciting. And so I I turned down Google. My wife still calls it my billion dollar mistake. Um, and we'll, well, I'm sure we'll end up coming back and talking about that as well. Uh, but to me, I was just so excited about the idea. I said, forget it. I'm moving up to Seattle. It's a very risky personal decision as well, because it was at the time uh, I just got engaged to be married. And with the sort of premise of like, we're going to settle down in the Bay Area. And like, I had to call up my wife and say, I've taken a new job. And by the way, we're moving to Seattle. And that was not a fun, I guess, fiance at the time, but she, she agreed to marry me anyway. <laughs> so it all worked out okay. So that was probably the next one. The uh, the next career decision I made was when I was leaving Microsoft. I thought I was going to stay at Microsoft for, you know, maybe a couple years. At the time, like when you're 22, 23 years old, a couple of years seems like a long time. I ended up staying there for six years. Um, ended up working on Office. That project ended up getting killed, which is also interesting learning in corporate politics. Worked on Windows and I worked on SQL Server. And when I was leaving, I thought, okay, that's enough big company. I'm going to go to a small company. And I ended up, another interesting decision was um, uh, the Google folks had sort of stayed on me through all that time. So a guy named Jonathan Rosenberg, who I know you know well, uh, Jonathan was running product at Google, had since back then. And he had just said, you know, every few months he would ping me and say, how's it going? And, um, and so I told him, hey, I'm thinking about coming back to the Valley. I'm pretty sure I'm going to start a company. Be happy to chat, chat about ideas. He said, why don't you come talk to people at Google? And at the time, um, my initial reaction was, I'm not going to Google. I'm coming out of a big company. Google's now a big company. I missed my chance. Google's now a big company. I'm going to go start something else. And um, he said, just come talk to people. And I ended up spending a day at Google. And this was, you know, in the era before, like a lot of little things were starting, but were not really real yet. And so there was, like, I think Chrome had just launched, but there was no Chrome OS. Um, there was no, I think Android had been purchased, but hadn't shipped yet. It was, you know, and so we're going through and basically the whole day was them exposing me to all these new things that are coming. So I end the day in Jonathan's office and he says, what do you think? And I said, uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like, um, pretty interesting ideas, but still feels like a big company to me. And he said, he got kind of mad at me and he said, he said, what are you talking about? This is like, we're just getting started. And this is like what Microsoft was like in the early nineties. Now what Microsoft is like now, and you def like, you definitely have to come. And by the way, you saw all these things that we're doing that are new, but even in like the core ad space, which is the, the heart of the business, he's like, we're just getting started. I mean, all the money gets spent on these stupid television ads and nobody even watches these, these television ads. And that was his last sentence. Right? As I, I leave his office and like, I got to go get on a plane and I'm leaving his office. And for some, as dumb as it sounds, that fact was news to me. They're like all the ads are, I'd never bought or sold an ad in my life. And he said, all the ads are in TV ads and nobody watches TV ads. And I just, that just like really got me thinking. And I ended up sitting on the plane. I wrote a little memo that was called, why doesn't television feel like the Super Bowl every day? This was 2008. So it was right after the Super Bowl. The, the, uh, the Giants had just ruined the Patriots season um, with the big, with the big win. And the, uh, we had had everybody over to watch Super Bowl at our house. And one of the things I remembered was everybody wanted me to rewind, not to watch the plays, but to watch the ads. And and it was this like, what is different about this moment? I wrote this paper about it and I thought, uh, you know, I got home kind of late. My wife was already asleep. I woke up kind of early. No, nobody was around to tell me my ideas were stupid. I emailed Jonathan and I say, I had a bunch of ideas on the plane. I'm fairly certain you've already thought of all these and I'm not going to start a company in this space. I don't really know anything about the space, but I'd love, you know, the thing you told me at the end of the meeting kind of spurred this uh, thought in me and, you know, I'm just going to send them to you. And if you like them, feel free to use them. 
And uh, he wrote me back right away. He's an early morning person as well. And he said, can we get on the phone? Got on the phone. He said, actually, nobody's working on those ideas. What if I made you a, a little division of Google that you could kind of run to go explore these ideas? And I made the fastest job decision I've ever made in my life. I mean, I, I basically accepted inside of an hour. Um, and I completely changed where everything was headed. Uh, and that's how I ended up at Google. I ended up, uh, that job sort of ended up, uh, there's more to the story, but basically ended up running the YouTube group. Um, and actually the core idea on that was, hey, why don't we make ads skippable? Which I thought was like such an obvious idea. It's like, a, you know, if any company is working on it, obviously Google should be working on it. Let's just make ads skippable and not charge people if they skip the ad. And that way we'll incent people to make better ads and we'll get the Super Bowl every day. And, you know, turned out that not only was nobody working on it, it turned out to be quite hard to do. And I ended up, it took me almost three years to get that product shipped. It's now called TrueView. And so that was, so let's see, first job decision was deciding to start Centrata. Second one was deciding to turn down Google and go to Microsoft following an idea. This was kind of same theme of like, I got so excited about idea, I joined Google. I'll just give you the last one was leaving Google. And, you know, so this was in 2014 and, uh, you know, I was, I, I was fairly certain I was going to leave YouTube. There was, I had sort of been there for a while. I had a whole bunch of new opportunities to go work on. And uh, at the time, Nat Sundar was taking over for Larry. And so Sundar and Larry had sort of floated a bunch of ideas for me. Um, and I had a friend, a guy named Alex Denai, uh, who I went to college with, actually, who was busy starting a company that thankfully wasn't working. And he said, um, he said, hey, uh, I'd love help brainstorming what we should pivot to. And so I ended up spending a bunch of time on whiteboards with him with my list of ideas. And one of the ideas was the idea I started with all the way at the beginning of the story was, hey, it's 20 years later, and I still think the world thinks that applications are over here and documents are over here, and that's really stupid because we run our companies on doc sheets and slides, and we pay for all these applications that nobody uses. Um, and maybe maybe it's time to go reinvent Office. And I tried 20 years ago, and it didn't work. Maybe we could try again. And he got really excited about it, and he said... Um, uh, and I, and I sort of made clear to him, I'm not starting this thing. I'm happy to invest. I'm happy to advise. This is for you to do. I got other things to go do, but I'd love if you did this. And, um, in that process, I started getting more and more sucked in to, to the idea. And at some point I just realized that I would kick myself if I didn't work on it. And I left Google to go work on it. And probably, so those are maybe, I guess, four, uh, big transitions I made. If I had to pick a single theme across all of them is, Every single time I've made a big transition, I have this list of criteria and I end up picking something that is the exact opposite of that list and following something that I'm really, really excited about. And, and it's interestingly, it hasn't failed me yet, but you know, whenever I, I advise people a lot on career transitions, they always show up with a list and it's like, well, I'm aiming for a company like this and a role like this and this sector and this thing. And I tell them, do you realize I like when I, you know, when I was, when I, chose to join Google, for instance, one of the things on my list was, I don't want to do anything ad related. I end up working on ads. You know, I, when I was, when I was thinking about I, each case, I've ended up sort of throwing away the list. And so if I had to give any advice coming out of it is, you know, leave yourself open to opportunities that may not fit your rubric. Um, cause sometimes the best opportunity just kind of breaks the mold a little bit. So anyways, those are some why oh, it's super stories. fascinating because, uh, you're one of the most structured people I know in terms of thinking. And in the past, I would tease you that you had a spreadsheet for everything. Now, I'm sh now you have a code up for everything. Sure. Um, yeah. And 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 yet, like I think the the passion for an idea is essentially what drove your career choices. I mean, it, it, it's it, I, just to be clear, I had a spreadsheet for everything and a coder for everything. Now, I just ignored it. And I think it's you know it's where we started with how would I describe myself to an alien? You know, I I just like building things. I like inventing things. And when I when I can picture something working. I, I think I think um, there's a really good line. Um, Peter Thiel wrote a good book called Zero to One. Um, and he talks about how a startup is defined as the smallest group of people you can get together that have a shared view of something that everyone else thinks is crazy. And it's like this this group has that has that viewpoint. And when you find that and you find that this this thing everybody else thinks is crazy, but this group doesn't, I think basically, and it, you know, it seems weird that I joined big company like Microsoft or Google based on that, but actually each case, it was like this small group of people that thought some other thing was crazy. I just get really excited about it. Um, and so that's been my, my story. No, that's super cool. Uh, you know, you talked about profession, like did 
thinking about money or how much you're going to earn or what your long-term financial stuff ever play into into these decisions? I mean, it did, and I and I and I think that, like I said, my um, my first couple decisions turned out on a relative basis to the alternatives to not be that financially rewarding. Um, and you know, you can look at that in lots of retrospect, and yeah, they're they're. Thankfully, things have worked out okay for me over time, and so I haven't I haven't had to look at it with a lot of regret. Um, but I, I do think it's I I think it's hard to ignore as a as a fact. I mean, if I think about you know choosing to turn on Google in in two thousand two, you know, it just wasn't really like I wasn't a very good investor. It wasn't really that obvious to me how, what Google was going to be. I, I'll tell you. Um, the best piece of advice I've gotten on this topic, and I give it all the time, is what I call small pond, big pond thinking. And it's a, it's a fairly sim- simple framework that when you're making a job decision, you're either going to be either going to be the big fish in a small pond or the small fish in a big pond. When you're the small fish in a big pond, so if you were to go join Google today or join Facebook today or Microsoft today or so on, the pond kind of is what it is. So you have to worry about the size of the fish. You worry about you know, what's my job going to be, you know, what's my project going to be, you know, what, uh, how, uh, how well resourced is it? And like, at some point you're worried about, will I get promoted? Which is, you know, you and I have lots of experience with that process and boy, that's a process I love to hate. Uh, the, um, and, uh, but it's a sort of a, a natural reality of when you're joining one of these places, that's like, that's what success is measured as. On the flip side, if you're going to be the big force, big fish joining a small pond, and relative to those ponds, basically every pond is a small pond, you have to worry about the size of the pond, not about the size of the fish. And interestingly, most people are pretty bad at this. And and, and I, by the way, I don't say that there's a lot of reasons why that's true. I mean, it's, first off, your, your economic returns tend to be oriented towards the size of the pond. So you're probably going to get stock. But it also happens that most of your career goals are aligned with the size of the pond. Because ponds that grow tend to attract better people, tend to you tend to learn more positive lessons, you tend to uh, tend to learn new skills because you're like you want to learn skills when things are working. You know, it's not that you can't learn things when things aren't working, but you learn better things when things are working. Um, and so I'll often tell people to come to me and say, "Hey, which of these decisions should I make?" And you know, many times they'll be looking at a big pond. And they'll like misunderstand the fish part of it. And so I'll help them through that. Or they're looking at a small pond. And generally the question I ask them is pretend you weren't joining and just tell me if a friend called you and said, I want to invest, you know, a large portion of my capital into a single company. How excitedly would you tell them invest in this one pond? And if I go back, that's a piece of advice to give all the time. Interestingly, and I, I, I don't live life with a lot of regrets. I'm quite happy with how things turned out. But if I go back to 2002 and look at my signal, all the smartest investors out there told me you'd be crazy not to put every dollar you have into Google. I mean, even in 2002, it was really obvious that it was going to be, it, it was going to be, a, 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 I don't think anybody understood. Everybody was off probably by two orders of magnitude, but it didn't matter because it was going to be 10 orders of magnitude bigger than where it was going to be. Um, and uh, and I just, I just kind of ignored it, which thankfully for me allowed me to work on a project I really cared about and, you know, Get, get, put me on the path to build what I really wanted to build over time. But it's interestingly, the probably the most important advice I give people is when you're making a job decision and you start thinking about money, when people hear that, interestingly, Google's offer to me was $10,000 less than Microsoft. So it actually, in my economic model, the Microsoft one was safer. Now, as dumb as I think it was like $90,000 a year versus $100,000. I mean, thinking about it in the big scheme of things, like the idea that that was even how I thought about the economics, I, attri- I attributed basically zero value to the Google stock because I didn't know how to think about it. I think that's actually a mistake a lot of people do even today. Like I've had conversations with people where they think like they're in a startup and it's zero value. Some startups probably, but a lot of other startups do have value and you have to look at the end result that, you know, that's why you're working in a startup. It's interesting when we when we give offers at Coda, we actually give people a little worksheet that is a an expected value calculator where we ask people to fill out this is what you know I think this company has this percentage chance of being this value this percentage chance of being this value so and if you were thinking like an investor that's how you invest right and one of the things people miss about investing is uh, you know one of the reasons that being an early stage investor can be so lucrative is that a tiny percentage chance of an enormous outcome can be really high. 
Um, and people miss orders of magnitude. They'll say like, it's only a 1% chance. I'll say, but a one in a hundred chance of a, of a 10,000 X outcome is a fantastic bet. You want to take that bet, right? <laughs> the, uh, and, and, you know, and then you kind of work your way up and you say it's a one in two chance of a two X outcome. Maybe you don't want to take that bet. And you sort of, you start to figure out where, where those things land, but actually training people on how to think like investors, I think as a startup founder, it's the thing you spend a lot of time doing. Um, so like most of the, most people don't understand it. If they don't understand, not only do they make bad decisions, they don't understand what they're joining. They don't understand the incentives of the place they're, they're joining. So I think it's actually a quite important part uh, of that process. Um, just following the line a little bit and pushing it, I know you've done a lot of angel investments. How do you think about the companies that you invest in and who you work, you know, what kind of, uh, how, like, do you think about it financially? Do you think about it just purely, uh, you know, as something you want to see exist? You know, it's, it's interesting. And it, there's a wide spectrum of those things. And maybe, maybe just to start first off, I'd say the world is oddly tilted towards rich people. And you know this better than, than most. Um, and it's most, the place it's clearest is in how the world treats investors. And, you know, it, it's sort of baked into so many, uh, ways that we think about, uh, money, but the fact that you have to be a qualified investor to invest in things makes plenty of sense in some ways, right? Like protecting people from, from, you know, bad investments, so on makes lots of sense, but it leads to, you only have access to these things and these, and if you, you only have access to real wealth generating opportunities, if you're already wealthy, um, the tax code is obviously, obviously tilted towards wealthy people. Your access to opportunities is tilted that way. Cause they, they tend to sort of work in the same circles. So it's, I think it's this completely unfair part of the world. Um, and I don't have a great answer on how to fix it other than things like what you guys are working on. Um, but the, but I do think first off, it's, it's a tilting that is unfair. And so it's, you know, worth, worth saying a front, I, I would say, you know, one of the things that, um, you learn early on as an investor is that investing is mostly about access and the, the, the interesting investments are often quite clear. Like the, you know, there are obviously some really risky ones and I've written a bunch of checks and things that you know, I'm never going to get back. And there are some where I wrote and I'm going to get a fantastic return. Um, and it's kind of unexpected, but if I look at my like best returns, they were in things that were fairly obvious that just turned out that I had better access than most people. If I think about, you know, for some of my biggest investments are Spotify, Pinterest, Instacart. So like, these are all companies for which, um, access is really important. And the main, the main thing I'd say about those is if you're valuable to others, then compensation comes. And, it's, and I think it's really important not to trade it. It's important not to condition it. Um, but in each case, those relationships started with a great conversation. They started with, you know, the case of Spotify, for instance, Daniel and I had many, many, many hours of conversations about uh, how to think about company building, how to think about bundling, how to so on before, you know, years later, he asked me to join the board. Um, and I could, and I could sort of meaningfully invest in the company. The, um, so I think access is, is, is important and, you know, being an investor, the world is already tilted toward favoring investors. Being an investor is mostly about access. It's actually not really about guessing, but in a lot of cases about access and access comes out of, out of being valuable to others. I mean, there's lots to be said about the riskier investments, which I know. You know, when people ask about angel investors, that's often what they picture. Honestly, it's not where your biggest bets go. I mean, for me, you know, I'll write fairly small checks into basically anything that I find personally interesting with a person I find personally interesting. Those are pretty small bets. And, you know, you tend to, but your real bets happen as those things scale. Um, and I think that mostly comes down to being present for others so that they call you when they need help. Yeah, uh, that's actually fascinating. I think one thing I wanted to tease out there is, in a way, um, the way you got, where you got written the bigger checks is, is actually the follow-ons and, and it, the follow-ons come when you provide value and when you've had, when you've Sometimes had those, I mean, it, you know, really Yeah, but getting a right to, you know, like I got a right to invest in Uber, at, uh, you know, for like not, not right at the beginning, but early enough to create a return. And that's all about providing value, but it was well past the point where everybody knew it was going to be a big company. Um, those are the opportunities that that are kind of uniquely create that way. If I go back a bit, you know, am I a better angel investor than others? I don't know. I, I don't think so. 
I, I, I don't think I'm, uh, I think I'm, uh, the, the, like my, the tilt of my portfolio is people I have access to. And I think I tend to have, I think I have, I tend to have, um, people like you that are, that are ambitious, interesting people. And that's why my portfolio is better. I don't think my decision-making framework is any, is particularly better. It's all sort of consequence of, uh, spending time with, with the right people and finding ways to be helpful to them. And, and, uh, how have you gone about sort of finding people like that? I mean, part of it is you were at Google, but you also, I think compared to many other people, you are really good at attracting people to you. You know, I think interesting people find interesting ideas. And so the, and ge generally the best way to find interesting people is, uh, and the most scalable piece of advice I give people is to write interesting things. Um, and I, I'm a big believer in writing in general. I think writing clarifies thinking. Writing is is a great way to take ideas and distill them. Um, it also allows you to put yourself on the record on things that may not be that obvious. I mean, like to go back to my experience with Daniel, for instance, like the, the thing he read that I written was this paper called Formats of Bundling that is kind of a contrarian view on why bundling works. And just turned out he thinks about it the same way. And it sort of caused the right conversation. You know, I, and I, I think when that happens, you just end up in the right the right spot with, with someone. So I, I, the, probably the most important advice I give people is, you know, being interesting is important, but write it down, get it out there and let it get, let it get, let it get spread, let it criticized, you know, not interesting. That's obviously not going to work as well. Uh, but if it is interesting, it'll find its way to the, to the right people. Now that you sort of look, look back on your last 10, 20 years, and obviously there's a lot of great advice. Do you think there's any advice you'd give to yourself 10 years back or 15 years? <laughs> you know, there's sort of implied in the question is, I mean, a lot of the stuff I just said, it's, it would obviously have been better to know it earlier. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't live with a lot of regret, so I don't think I would go back and say, Hey, I should have evaluated that Google deal differently and, and, uh, and, and taken it. Cause I, I, you know, at the end of the day, things happen for a reason. They like, you can't really isolate one thing and, you know, the universe uh, for all, all the people here that like watching Marvel movies, the, the, uh, you know, the metaverse ends up with a, you know. You don't always want to end up on a different universe. <laughs> exactly. Not... No, and, and, and where we where we are is a is a consequence of so many small small things that I think, at least speaking for both of us, I mean, I don't think I would change a single thing in my life because I'm very happy with where I am. Right. Exactly. I mean, I do think that uh, you know, advice I tend to give often is some of what I just said. Is the I think this uh, this this idea of you know, be helpful to others. They'll they'll the right returns will come. Don't be transactional. There's a, there's a wonderful, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the exact name of the book. Adam Grant wrote the book, Give and Take or Givers and Takers. I forget exactly what the name of the book is, but it's a, it's a fantastic idea of like, it actually has a little worksheet of like every day you're supposed to go look and say today, did I give more? Did I take more? Uh, I think it's a very interesting way to come out of every conversation and say, what did I, you know, what did I give? What did I take? Um, and, you know, the, the, the best path to, and I don't think it's really odd, like, you know, early on I would have people, I had a friend, I probably shouldn't name and uh, early on who had a very, um, you know, distrustful view of the world and, you know, would give me advice and say, sure, you're being a sucker. You got to ask for this in return. You got to contract this thing. And I'd say, I don't know, it feels uncomfortable. I'm just not going to ask. And sometimes, you know, that, that you'll get taken advantage of. It's okay. Um, and, but other times you'll be, you know, pleasantly surprised by how one opportunity leads to another. Um, so I think it's really important. I think another thing I'd probably say is, you know, most interesting opportunities present themselves at unexpected times and unexpected ways. Um, I, I, I think that that's a, that's a lot of, a lot of people, and I, like you said, I, I do tend to be a framework driven thinker. I tend to have a, a way of thinking about the things in front of me, but leaving yourself open to, hey, you know, the unexpected conversation, the, uh, you know, I had a, an old mentor who would just tell me that at least three meetings a week 
should be with someone that you have no like immediate business with, no immediate interest with, no immediate, just go meet someone, help them with something, learn about their business, learn about what they're up to, and you're just fine. There's, something interesting will happen. And uh, you have to create opportunities for that. So if you over systematize yourself, I think that's, that isn't, that isn't, uh, that isn't a great way to do it. Spontaneity is super, super, super important. Hey, um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you on, this is a bit of a debacha away from your life, but I know one of the things you've done over the years is collect best practices. And right now you're collecting the best practices of companies, the rituals that companies go through. Uh, is there any one that you wanted to share with uh, everyone that you think is particularly insightful or that you were like, wow, I would not have thought of that. And that's super interesting. Yeah, I mean, maybe, so maybe the background for people, I'm writing a book called Rituals of Great Teams. You can go learn more at ritualsofgreatteams.com. Um, it started the the uh, basically right at the beginning of the pandemic with a conversation I had with a guy named Bing Gordon. Uh, and Bing is now a famous investor, He, um, uh, but he was the chief creative officer at Electronic Arts. Uh, he's now you know a big investor and board member of Amazon, Zynga, a bunch of really interesting companies. And he and I happened to be on this board together and he kept harassing the CEO with this question. He said, what are your golden rituals? And at some point we said, Bing, what do you mean by golden rituals? And I think Bing is one of the best nonlinear thinkers in the Valley. So I, I really enjoyed his response. And he said, um, he said, well, uh, great companies have a small list of golden rituals and they meet three criteria. Uh, number one, they're named. Number two, every employee knows them by their first Friday. And number three, they're templated. And he immediately rattled off examples. Amazon has six pagers and Google has OKRs and Salesforce has V2 mom. And there's all these different rituals that, that companies have. And this idea was just really sticky for me. I love the word. I love the word ritual. It sort of uh, you know, conveys a lot of uh, importance, I think. Um, and I started talking about it on when I met Pip met people, started talking about a podcast, and people started sending me rituals. And then when the pandemic started, uh, we were all kind of bored out of our minds, and the uh, and we decided to do a dinner series. So every, basically for the last three years, every three to four weeks, I host a, a dinner, I'm doing one on Wednesday this week, where I get, you know, 10, 15, 20 people together, and it's a simple format, everybody shares a ritual. Um, and so over the course of that time, I've met about a 1,000 different teams and leaders, big companies, small companies, you know, authors, entrepreneurs, all sorts of people. I've taken, uh, I, I've taken the, basically about a hundred of those rituals and I put them into this framework in this book, Rituals of Great Teams. Um, and I'm publishing a chapter at a time. So you can go, you can go and take a look and actually help me with it. If you want to sign up on that, that site. So I have lots of interesting examples. Um, I mean, in terms of one to share, it's always hard to pick one because the, there's a, a very, very long list. Um, the, uh, maybe I'll just share first off the one that, that would be true of Coda. So if you were to ask an average Coda employee on their first Friday what the Coda golden ritual is, they would almost certainly tell you about a thing we do called Dory and Pulse. And it's a very simple idea. Um, but if you come into a Coda meeting, you'll see we, we have a written culture. You'll see a, a write-up of what we're trying to review. And at the bottom of that write-up, you'll see what we call Dory and Pulse. So Dory is how we ask questions. So rather than, you know, talk over each other or raise hands in a meeting, everybody writes down their questions and they vote them up and down. Dory's named after the fish who asks all the questions. Um, and at, you know, at Google, for ex-Googlers, they'll remember it as the name of the tool we used for uh, big all hands. But at Coda, we use it for even fairly small, even if it's a two-person meeting, this is how we'll, we'll do it. Um, and it's meant to remove bias. Um, the uh, And then the other thing we'll do, which is probably even more important, is Pulse. So we'll have a decision we need to make, and we have a, a, a little table there, and everybody writes what their viewpoint on the decision is. And generally, there's a, a score or a number. I agree one to five, and then you write why. And the way we do it is we hide everybody else's until you're done writing. And so it's a, it's meant to remove the group think that comes out of a natural decision-making process. Now, if you were to ask Coda employees on the first Friday for our golden ritual, they would almost certainly tell you about Dorian Pulse, partially because they've probably seen it 20 times in their first week. It's like, it'd be weird to come to one of our meetings and not see one. Um, but they don't really care about it because they're meeting wonks. They care about it because it's reflective of the culture of the company. And so I'll hear them talk to their friends and they'll say, oh yeah, I joined this company, Coda, and you know I've been there for a week and 
you know, it's really amazing. They have this this uh, philosophy that great ideas can come from anywhere. And the way it plays out is this thing called Dorian Pulse. And like this week, I outvoted the CEO on this question. And then this other decision, I got my I got my input in in this thoughtful way that was actually read and considered and incorporated and, you know, not shouted over and not sort of group thinked over and, and so on. So I think of that as a very good ritual that, you know, can dramatically change your decision making culture. Um, but it's really important that the mechanic is less important than the cultural statement. You know, great ideas can come from anywhere is the statement that is reinforced by the rituals. I often say rituals are a mirror of culture. Um, so that's, a, that's one good example. Oh, that's a, that's a great example. Thank you. I, I mean, I've, I've known about it and, uh, you know, we, we do a little bit of Dory ourselves and we've, over the years, we've created a couple of rituals. Um, at Arda, we have a ritual of kudos that we offer every Thursday, every, we have our assemble every Thursday. And then there's another one, which didn't start off as a ritual, but has become pretty interesting, which is called Spotlight. So every artisan uh, gets about 40 minutes where they talk about their life. And it started initially because we were a distributed company and started during the pandemic, but uh, eventually it's turned into something that's really positive. It's fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, totally see those the part of ritual. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely love them. Shishir, thanks for sharing so much with us. Uh, I just want to close up with one quick lightning round of a couple of questions. Okay, so not much thought, we just answer them. So these will be fill in the blanks. So if you want to prosper, never underestimate the power of? Paying it forward. Paying it forward. Fantastic. Yeah. Everybody, anybody who hasn't watched that movie, you should go watch that movie. It's very good. <laughs> it is a good movie. Yeah. Uh, it is a good movie. Uh, the three key ingredients of a long, fulfilling life are one, two, three. Oh, boy. Okay. One, two, three. Um, happiness is about the delta between expectations and reality. So I think it's many people focus on reality, but actually expectations are what create happiness. Uh, let's see, the second one I'd say... This was the end of my high school graduation speech is never let play get in the way of work. Never let, never let work get in the way of play. Balance is very important. Um, and maybe relevant to this, this group, uh, your personal health is an investment only you can make. Most other things other people care about too, but your health is uniquely your problem and your responsibility. So I think that's a helpful one as well. That is beautiful. Uh, thank you so much, Shishir, for having spent this time and for sharing all of your observations and great insights with all of our, our listeners. Thank you. Thanks, Caesar.